uh, I'm happy to see all of you. Welcome again for our thematic session for, for the Blue Growth. As you may already know, I'm Milena Krasic. I'm a deputy pillar coordinator from the Montenegrin side. And I share this position with my Greek dear colleagues who are also here, uh, Irene Mansuni and Theanis Tomatopoulou. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing correctly the surnames. Sorry for that and for, for the presenters later. It is our pleasure to walk you through the session, to introduce you with the speakers, with the panelists. Uh, our panelists come um, mainly from the EU member states, uh, from the EU countries, of, of course. And today, together with us, we have representatives for the Euro European Commission, who will act uh, as a keynote speaker, speaker one. And uh, second one will be sum up uh, the results of our session. As you know, we already have support from the European Commission side. Uh, and now, Yorgos, you would like to say a few words in the, on behalf of the, of the Commission. Thank you. Dear partners and participants in the user pillar one session, I, wel I welcome you uh, on behalf of the DG Regio. First of all, I would like to thank the Bosnian and Herzegovinian Presidency for organizing the eighth user annual forum. Today's se uh, session allows us to trigger the discussion and strengthen our joint efforts for cooperation and coordination with open and transparent participation, inclusiveness and multi-level governance of the USR. To discuss interesting topics which have already been raised or are proposed to be implemented in the countries of the Adriatic Ionia region, focusing on how to incorporate new emerging promising sectors of the new blue economy, fostering development and sustainability in the Adriatic and Ionia region towards the challenges of climate change. There are many opportunities, but there are also a lot of challenges. Effective cooperation also requires funds. The USR has the potential to mobilize a large spectrum of national, private, and EU funds, including cohesion policy funds and directly managed funds, such as Horizon Europe, Life, Cosme, and others. It is therefore essential that the valuable work that the USR is doing in mobilizing ERDF MFAF and IPA3 funds available in national and regional programs to finance joint projects with benefits for the whole region. The process is a, what we call the embedding process. The USR is currently under a revision process to make sure that the USR founding documents, which were created in 2014, take into account the new reality. The result of, of the today's discussion in the revision working group also identified the methodology to guide the thematic study groups in preparing the contents of the action plan. The revised action plan should be flexible and aligned with the multi-annual financial framework 2021-27. Targets and topics should be planned for the mid-term future of 2030 and the long-term future of 2050. Modification of action plan proposed by countries have to be approved by governing board. For this purpose, a new feature in the revised action plan will be a specific chapter dedicated to horizontal cross-cutting topics for each pillar. We hope that today's discussion can contribute also to this joint objective of thematic history group session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yorgos. You said, uh, tell uh, basically everything what I want to say, but uh, I, I will continue. <laughs> moderating this on my way. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> as you may know, probably all of uh, you are informed, uh, the topic of our session is the blue growth emerging promising sectors, fostering development and sustainability and in the Adriatic and Union region. Emerging sectors of the blue economy can serve both the need of economic development of Adriatic and Union regions and sustainability towards the challenges of the climate change. Also, they have potential to generate economic growth, create jobs, and support local communities, while ensuring the protection and conservation of the marine ecosystem, ecosystem and its resources. In the context of the Pillar 1 session, issues concerning the development of the blue economy in the Adriatic and Union region will be discussed. In the more detail, reference will be made to the contribution of integrated water management from the desalination to wastewater management, in addition, innovative methods that contribute to extending life of the fish, as well as monitoring of the freshness of the food will be presented. 
And finally, a way to strengthen cooperation and collective actions for the sustainable and innovative development of the blue economy in the Adriatic Union region will be explored. So we are happy to welcome our distinguished uh, speakers, panelists, uh, that are coming from the European Commission, universities, institutes, and consult co consultants from the countries of the Adriatic Union macro region. And before starting, uh, we would like to invite our audience for the question, uh, of course, in the discussion part after we finish all, with all presentation. And we now are going to move or, at our panel. And for the beginning of our session, we invite our keynote speaker to introduce us with our topic. We invite Ms. Eleni Kaziani, who is working for EG Mare, Sea Basin, Unit for the Sea Basin Strategies, Maritime Regional Cooperation, and Maritime Security. And Eleni will present to us sustainable development of emerging blue economy sectors at the Adriatic Union region with accent on the cooperation. Eleni, the floor is yours for next 15 minutes. Thank you, Thank you very much, Milen. I just need uh, um, to change the slides. You have this question. Uh, you can see the slide over there. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, thank you. But first of all, allow me to thank the hosts and the organizers for this uh, session and for the invitation to Digimare to participate to the session of Pillar One. Uh, as you know, Digimare is following on behalf of the Commission the developments of Pillar One uh, in cooperation with Digiregio. Uh, as you know, Digiregio is the lead service uh, for the macro regional strategies but we are very glad to follow all the developments of Pillar 1 and also very interested to be aware and uh, to be involved in the way we can help and support uh, for the cross-cutting aspects with other pillars. Uh, a lot of them will be raised today in this concept of, of the discussion. So I'm Eleni Hadziani. I'm working at Digimare in Unit A3 on the Maritime Regional uh, Cooperation, Maritime Security and Sea Basin Strategies. And uh, uh, regarding this uh, uh, a particular session today, uh, I will be glad to, to provide you the, the overall framework and the policies of Digimare for the sustainable blue economy uh, and how we can, uh, let's say, uh, uh, stress our efforts, uh, how we can further mobilize the stakeholders, the EU countries and all the stakeholders on national, regional and global level towards uh, a cooperation for the sustainability in the in the blue economy sectors. We will focus on the emerging sectors, but we will provide also the general uh, framework to see how that fits uh, with our policies and the and the funding schemes. So, um, the numbers regarding the blue economy sectors very well known uh, in terms of the significance, the high numbers uh, for both uh, the employment levels but also the growth added value, and that comes from for a lot of uh, maritime sectors, either in the coastal zone, but also in the open sea, uh, relate to what we call traditional sectors, like for example, the fisheries, the aquaculture, but also related to some more emerging new sectors, like those you have the opportunity from the uh, speakers to, 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 to be informed uh, today, and uh, all of those, let's say, generate uh, a huge uh, economical potential uh, around the EU and beyond. These numbers come from uh, our Blue Economy Report uh, 2022. These days, uh, during the European Maritime Day in Brest, uh, our commissioner is, is uh, presenting uh, uh, in public uh, the, the, the figures and the updates uh, in the Blue Economy Report 2023. But again, these numbers and all the figures are up to date and uh, comes from, uh, uh, let's say, relevant uh, uh, mapping and studies of the European Commission and uh, cooperative um, uh, organizations. Uh, so, um, focusing now on. Uh, uh, thank you, please. Okay, it's working. So focusing now on uh, a couple of variety of the sectors, you see uh, some more figures. These are updated figures, which uh, will, uh, are going to be, uh, let's say, further described uh, today in the European Maritime Day. Uh, well, well, you can have an idea regarding the different activities, uh, living resources, the majority, 
but also coastal tourism, maritime transport, non-living resources, shipbuilding, etc., etc., marine energy. You can see there in a very simple, let's say, allocation with simple terms, different activities, including both traditional and also other sectors. And in the diagram also on the, on the, on the right side, uh, on a more, let's say, uh, schematic feature in terms of numbers as well, and the average the remuneration uh, for that uh, sectors. So focusing more on uh, what we call emerging sectors, let's have an idea regarding, for example, numbers in terms of, um, uh, let's say, uh, economic uh, potential, for example, the desalination, the blue bioeconomy, the blue energy, the research and education, uh, very well related with the other sectors because research and education supports and, and uh, should support uh, the development of the, of the um, um, uh, emerging sectors. And of course, the wave and tidal capacity, what we call in, a, in one term, blue energy, uh, very, let's say, uh, well related to the renewable energies, which are, let's say, a very, a very um, uh, concrete part of what we call decarbonization, greening uh, in line with the European Green Deal and our approach for uh, sustainability. Uh, now, um, a closer look to blue energy and to algae sector. The reason I'm referring to those uh, are because uh, uh, blue energy with uh, a different uh, varieties of uh, uh, deployments we can have uh, and different ways we can use the energy comes from uh, uh, the wind and also from the sea. Uh, well, you can see here a couple of uh, information regarding the TRL levels, which are very important when we address uh, how we can use the research and the innovation for uh, innovative uh, projects for that sector, but also uh, a closer look to the algae sector because it's a very promising new sector, uh, very, let's say, um, desirable in terms of new forms of aquaculture, in terms of sustainable food, and by the way, the European Commission, DG Mare in, in particular, has published very soon uh, our algae initiative, focusing on this particular sector, very promising in terms of uh, biotechnology and sustainable food. Um, now, speaking of sustainability, um, a couple of years ago, two years ago, uh, European Commission has published the new approach for sustainability in the blue economy sectors. This communication is uh, what we say the blue arm of the European Green Deal. As you know, the European Green Deal has been uh, published in 2019. By that time, there was not COVID, uh, but uh, two years ago, one year ago, we realized how, how well linked uh, all these activities were also uh, from the uh, efforts to the recovery of the COVID, because European Green Deal underlines the decarbonization, the greening, uh, the digitalization, the sustainability in several sectors of the economy. And uh, speaking of recovery of COVID, all these aspects are very important and very significant in terms of uh, how we develop uh, uh, different sectors of economy towards the recovery from the COVID sector, which had a significant severe, uh, severe uh, effects to the, to the uh, economy as well. So this aspect of sustainable blue economy is uh, relevant to what we already uh, know regarding the sustainability as the triple section of uh, uh, environmental, uh, social, and economic sustainability. And uh, in line, as I said, with the European Green Deal uh, access and, and priorities. Um, now, uh, with this communication, actually what we do is to pass from the initial sectoral policies, and this is the fisheries policy a couple of years ago, and the maritime transport policy, to integrated maritime policy with the maritime framework strategy directive and the maritime special planning, and then passed to blue growth in 2012, and now are coming to the sustainable blue economy, which is the new term we use uh, instead of the blue growth, which was a couple of years ago. Uh, so. What we do and what we focus with this communication, first of all, uh, towards the decarbonization. And speaking of decarbonization, you can see there the renewable energies, blue energy in different forms, but also how we change and how we transform the different activities taking place in, whole, in, in ports by addressing the ports as um, 
sustainable smart hubs connecting the, 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 the cities with the open sea in front of them. Speaking of biodiversity and coastal resilience, we are referring to the protection, to the preservation of biodiversity, how we can make our um, places, our coastal communities more resilient to several challenges, like for example, the erosion, the coastal erosion uh, as an effect of climate change, but also how we can further support the ecosystem services, focusing, for example, on uh, developing the natural-based solution. Responsible food system, this is uh, where the algae sector and the initiative on, on algae comes, but also sustainable aquaculture, very, very relevant with the objectives also of Pillar 1. Uh, and the European Commission last year has published the guidelines for sustainable aquaculture, uh, a very, let's say, good uh, a set of guidelines for the, for the countries to see how they can further progress on the development of aquaculture sector in a more sustainable way. Uh, and speaking of circularity, which is actually uh, a cross-cutting issue, if I may say, and horizontal uh, aspect, and uh, EU CER is taking uh, um, uh, consideration of that, uh, focusing, for example, on uh, circularity in several sectors like the fisheries, the aquaculture, the coastal maritime tourism, the transport, the ports, uh, focusing also on the prevention of marine litter, very relevant with the circularity and the circular approach, but also recycling in ships, in port facilities, etc. And apart from those, some new initiatives, very new actually, are first of all, the very new fisheries and the ocean package, which has been published in February 2023, with four elements. The communication on the energy transition and decarbonization in fisheries sector, on an action plan to restore the marine ecosystem, the communication on the common fisheries policy today and tomorrow, and also a report on the common market, which also was, uh, let's say, uh, deliverable uh, from the European Commission, and now it's ready regarding the fishery and the aquaculture products. Apart from that, the revision of the uh, European marine security uh, strategy that was uh, finalized in March 23, and uh, don't forget the cross-cutting enablers. And those are, first of all, the cooperation, we will have the time to explain better, and the innovation. Because uh, innovation, and in particular, the smart specialization, has found to be a key driver for uh, implementing the new approach for sustainability in the blue sectors through maritime cooperation. We'll uh, be back to, to that uh, uh, later. Speaking of cooperation, uh, around Europe and uh, beyond, because some of them are including uh, uh, non-EU countries or accession countries, we have several frameworks of cooperation. I will start with the sea basin strategies because uh, they are in the remit of DG Mare. Um, let's focus on the Mediterranean because it's of your interest and this is the West Med Initiative. It's a sea basin strategy including uh, European and Southern Mediterranean countries on the western part of the basin. Uh, of course, there are two more sea basin strategies uh, in, the, in the Black Sea, and the other one is um, in, in the Atlantic. Uh, and also, let's focus here on two of the four macro-regional strategies, and I'm referring to two because those two, the Baltic one and the EU sir, have a strong uh, maritime uh, dimension. Uh, we also uh, work with uh, the framework of cooperation in the outermost regions in cooperation with DG Regio, and uh, in particular, UFM, uh, the Union for Mediterranean Framework, a very concrete and strong framework of cooperation, including Mediterranean, uh, European and Southern Mediterranean countries, with particular priorities on blue economy and with uh, the renewed uh, Ministerial Declaration on Sustainable Blue Economy, which has been adopted in February 2021. I'm showing this to, to explain that there are concrete frameworks of cooperation with particular objectives, particular priorities towards sustainability, which can provide uh, a very good ground of cooperation and for further efforts uh, for the countries and the stakeholders to cooperate and to implement uh, projects. Uh, now, speaking of innovation, which is, uh, as, I, as I raised uh, earlier, found to be a key driver, an enabler to your sustainability. 
Uh, regarding smart specialization strategies, which is not something new, it's a concept introduced by the Euro Commission a couple of years ago, focusing on the cooperation uh, among what we call parts of the equitable helix, the public sector, the private sector, the research and academia, and the citizens, the, 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 the NGOs, for example, the citizens in general, the society, which is actually uh, a, an initiative with a place-based approach, with a bottom-up approach, uh, trying to transform the research ideas, but interesting for the uh, uh, communities, uh, uh, with a direct impact to the market with innovative uh, entrepreneurial products. So, in terms of blue economy, Digimare, the last years we have um, stressed our efforts in order to highlight this aspect of the implementation of uh, smart specialization strategies for uh, maritime activities uh, in the mainstream programs, uh, in the operational programs, the national, the regional operational programs, and of course in our program in the European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund. But apart from that, we also stressed our efforts to mobilize the stakeholders to cooperate together for the implementation of their smart specialization strategies through uh, transnational, transregional, uh, cross-border uh, projects. Uh, so what we did uh, is that we organized a couple of uh, broker sessions, uh, workshops focused on five topics. Uh, fisheries, aquaculture, marine renewable energies, coastal maritime tourism, and uh, blue biotechnology. Uh, those topics uh, were in the top of the agenda of more than 40 European regions in the previous programming period. So that was the reason we addressed these topics, but of course they, they are not the only ones. Huh? We just started with those. Uh, and uh, in, that, uh, in those um, uh, workshops we invited, and uh, we are very glad that they were so keen the stakeholders to come together, to discuss together, to, to, to raise their interest and their needs in order to be able to further create what we call innovative partnerships and cooperate together, uh, creating uh, consortia, preparing proposals to be funded as, as projects. Uh, so, uh, just an idea uh, regarding the topics which are interest of pillar one. From these workshops uh, regarding the blue biotechnologies, these were uh, thematic priorities which have been raised by the stakeholders during these workshops. Algae, bioproducts from invasive species, bioplastics, farming waste materials, circularity, uh, aquaculture to go hand to hand with uh, biotechnology, and uh, I'm sure it's uh, uh, obvious the reason why. Uh, if we move to aquaculture now, new types of energy, alternative types of energy, aquaponics, uh, regulatory and business models for integrated multitrophic aquaculture, space and investments, how we uh, allocate the space, and this is very relevant with the implementation of the maritime special planning, because this provides the ecosystemic approach for the allocation of different activities in the coastal and the marine environment, mussel farmings, and also other types of farming from aquaculture. Uh, fisheries, you can see here some priorities, social innovations, innovations to reduce the environmental impact, marine litter, decarbonization, marketing and product innovation, data and digitalization. These priorities have been shared with us, with uh, uh, DGRDD for uh, preparing, uh, when preparing the, the program and the relevant calls, and we are taking also into consideration for our further activities in Digimare and our potential, let's say, uh, calls in terms of the uh, European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund and also in cooperation with DigiRegio when exchanges and uh, providing our feedback uh, for relevant uh, um, activities. So these were our milestones for this mass specialization strategies already presented. Uh, let's focus on the three uh, with this uh, pink, like uh, light pink color. Now uh, we are focusing on uh, mobilizing the stakeholders for creating innovational partnerships. Uh, we have set up together with DG Regio uh, a smart specialization platform focusing on sustainable blue economy. And uh, now DG Regio is, is publishing calls for the stakeholders to express their interest to create partnership in order to be able to take the advantages of several services, of capacity building uh, seminars, of workshops, of external expertise, etc. 
A few ideas for this uh, platform you can find in the particular website of uh, DigiRegio with a lot of information and all this I presented so you can uh, uh, further be informed and, and express uh, your interest to create a partnership. Yes. Yes. A, a few information regarding the EMFAF. There are also a lot of information and a lot of opportunities there. Uh, either through direct uh, management, but also through shared management. And uh, now uh, in the Mediterranean, also a couple of topics like, for example, the maritime clusters, a lot of information and opportunities there for a good proposals uh, towards a sustainable blue economy, including the emerging sectors. And uh, I will finish with the horizon because, as you know, it's, let's say, the program focusing on research and innovation with um, uh, high, uh, let's say, numbers of uh, budget available, and uh, also uh, focusing on uh, these novelties of the horizon of Europe, which are the missions. One of them is the mission on uh, ocean, sea, and waters with what we call mission lighthouse. One of them for the Mediterranean, focusing on marine pollution. There, emerging sectors and uh, relevant projects uh, can be uh, very well placed um, to be implemented by the uh, countries and to take the opportunity for the call, which is already open, the third one, uh, and, and it will be, uh, let's say, open until uh, a couple of months. So uh, you can see here some more information, but also the uh, presentation will be shared so uh, you can have a look. And of course, we are at your disposal for any further information and also uh, more clarifications on that. The Sustainable Blue Economy a Partnership, this is my last slide, also a co-funded uh, uh, partnership uh, uh, in terms of Horizon Europe with particular innovation areas. This is the way I'm showing these areas because there, there are a lot of uh, opportunities relevant with thematic priorities related to emerging, emerging blue economy sectors, which can be also of your interest for potential proposals. So thank you very much. and. Uh, I'll be here for any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Eleni. Sorry for acting as a policeman, but I will no, continue no, to do that. It's <laughs> normal. <laughs> we need to be on time. We also want to, to, to have a discussion part, which is also important for us, because we have a limited uh, number of presentations. But uh, of course, you will be uh, able to, to raise your question after. Thank you, Eleni, for your comprehensive presentation. I think the audience uh, have opportunity to see um, a bunch of uh, information you, you provided, also calls, also initiatives uh, running by the European Commission. So uh, a very good uh, introduction to our subject. Let's move to our panel now. And our first panelist is Professor Fr Francesco Fatone. Professor Fatone is full professor of the Chemical Environmental Engineering and the Polytechnic University of March in Italy. Uh, since 2013, Francesco working on many positions, such as coordinator for Horizon 2020 Innovation Action Smart Plan, worked on uh, 20 EU-funded projects, associate or guest editor of scientific, uh, several scientific journals, chair of some international conference, expert committee about circular economy, and so on. So Professor Fatona will present the current framework of the water scarcity, potential and the risk related to the desalination plants, addressing also the technical, economic and environmental sustainability. Water scarcity is becoming drastic in Mediterranean and Adriatic and Ionian macro region. So sea water desalination may be an interesting option uh, that should be considered together with increased resilience, water efficiency and other integrated solutions. Professor, floor is yours. So thank you very much for your uh, introduction. And uh, well, please act a, a police woman. Tell me when I, two minutes are left. And thanks the organizer for this invitation. And, and thanks also to Federico that uh, contacted me for this very interesting uh, uh, opportunity for me to share my uh, my knowledge. Actually, I'm. Uh, fellow of the International Water Association, and uh, there I'm uh, coordinating the resource recovery cluster at the global level, and I'm ambassador of Water Europe, where I'm leading the circular water. So my role is to link the freshwater, I'm a freshwater engineer, 
with what is uh, the potential of seawater. And now the presentation uh, highlighted a lot how desalination is an important point in the blue economy. It was not that, that way a few years ago. So my point is, uh, okay, what is the situation in the Mediterranean Basin? Among us, I'm coming from Italy, you know the news from Italy. I'm going to show something to you. Scarcity, stress and floods, that's the situation. And then I'm going to move to examples of uh, how we cannot replicate what they are doing in Israel. We have to fit our own needs. That's not a copy paste of what they're doing in North Africa or in Israel. I will show some examples. And then I will show some numbers of case studies. And finally, I will present some projects where we are working. So climate change in the Mediterranean area is a very uh, drastic situation because it's a not spot for climate change. And uh, this is influencing uh, the weather conditions, is influencing uh, uh, all uh, uh, the extreme theory. Uh, well, some uh, examples. This is from Italy. You know, just three months ago, news in Italy, we were discussing about severe drought and water scarcity. And we started a special national legislation about water scarcity. Now, three months after, we are discussing about flooding and people that are dying because of uh, floods. But still, water scarcity is a problem because we don't have enough retention. This is the situation, how to move. We have to revise completely our extreme theory. The way I was learned, I was taught how to design infrastructure is no longer valid. That's the situation. And uh, well, I was invited by our Senate uh, because we have a special legislation in Italy about water scarcity. And uh, I was invited as expert to show what I'm going to show to you now. So it's not only European policy support, but this will be operative uh, next week in Italy. So it's very urgent uh, to act and to uptake. They were asking me what we can take from research. And this was a very difficult question because some of our solutions are not ready and we have to act now. So my point is, OK, Let's start from the framework. As I mentioned, I'm Water Europe ambassador, and in Water Europe, uh, we are discussing about uh, what are the innovation area, and one is multiple waters. So fit for purpose water, desalination is one of these, and have to be considered together to all other sources of water for proper uses. In many cities, in many regions, uh, we cannot think about desalinated water for agriculture. It's not sustainable. We have to think about the desalinated water for high level uses. That's not the same situation that we have in other countries. So, and for these, we can take advantage of digitalization and of hybrid green, green infrastructure, nature-based solution that in coastal areas are very, are very crucial. So in this scenario, how can we move? Well, this is a real example. We are doing this in the province of Pesaro Urbino. It was hit by the, uh, the flooding now and uh, this is the waste use, uh, water uses uh, and water sources. Uh, and this is the balance. You know, these data are usually not available. So in our projects, we write a lot of nice uh, graphs. Uh, but in reality, these data in regions are not available. So we don't know how much we need to take from this animation in a sustainable way. So we need a systemic approach. These data are from uh, a, a province that is about 300,000 population of population uh, that is anyway a highly relevant province from a touristic point of view and from an economic point of view. So in that scenario, desalination is here to be considered together with all possible water sources from rainwater harvesting to aquifer recharge that is affected anyway from seawater intrusion to maintenance of existing reservoir. So as you can see, it's a complex system that will need systemic solution. After this, we can move and line by line, we will analyze the economics. So how to plan water at regional level? That's the challenge to be discussed together. And uh, one of these points is desalination. What about desalination? This is desalination in the world. Well, as we can see, it's a consolidated technology. We have uh, uh, thousands, millions of uh, cubic meters that are desalinated all around the world. Of course, the majority is in Gulf countries, uh, where again, they are using Designated water also for agriculture. In Europe, uh, I will show some uh, uh, situation in the Mediterranean. Uh, we have a uh, quite fragmented situation. Sorry, this is okay. 
And this institution in Europe, look, mainly in Spain and in Sicily, in Cyprus, we have uh, uh, plans that are done or planned. I want to highlight this. For example, here you have a, a, a spot in Elba, Elba Island. They planned this uh, desalination plant more than 10 years ago. These data are from 20, 2010. Still now, the plant is under construction. So, till now, for the protection of uh, sea resources, uh, we were taking more than 10, 15 years to build a desalination plant. That is the reality. Now, we need to simplify this uh, uh, permitting phase, uh, but at the same time to protect and safeguard the ecosystem. That is the challenge. Because so far, we were not doing. And what is the cost of not doing? So, at the moment, uh, all these plants are under, let's say, design or construction. There are large treatment plants. One is in Veneto region, one is in Puglia, and others are under discussion in other, um, other regions. So, that's, that's a challenge. And what about technologies? Well, here you see there are several possible technologies, but the main ones are based on membrane processes, reverse osmosis. I will not go too much in detail about reverse osmosis, but what is the challenge of reverse osmosis? Well, here you can see, you know, this is reverse osmosis RO, and the vast majority is reverse osmosis. Uh, when I do desalination reverse osmosis, uh, I take 100 uh, and 40, 50, I give back to the sea. It's with uh, about double salinity, okay? So when you think about how to move here, I need to think about uh, a challenge. That is the water, energy, environment nexus. Why? Because uh, I am increasing the energy consumption to produce fresh water. I am increasing the carbon footprint to produce water. And be careful, the cost of brand disposal is from 5 to 30% on the OPEX. That is very, very relevant. So this has to be taken into account into my holistic approach to desalination. And how to take this into account? I will uh, show you now some numbers. And well, even in the Senate, they were surprised when I showed these numbers. You know, to pump one uh, cubic meter of water from a lake or a river, you have uh, 300 watt. To produce this unneeded water, you will spend 2,000 to 8,000 watt. And if with this, I consider also the carbon footprint, I can understand how not sustainable is to think about desalination for everything. No, desalination should be in a more holistic plan. And with this in mind, uh, my point is always, don't trust all the time about fragmented data. Because I see some data from the web that are talking only about the membrane system. But the desalination plant uh, is more complex. We are taking water from the sea. We have a uh, relevant pretreatment. We are using the membrane. So overall, uh, we spend what I mentioned before, two to eight kilowatt hour per cubic meter. is a lot. About technologies, uh, we have a lot of, uh, my time is finished, I'm going faster. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, solutions uh, that are already in place. We can recover energy to different turbines. So a lot of uh, solutions are already there. The challenge is now to couple renewable energy with the desalination. And with this, I see a lot of potential, but some of these uh, renewable energy are already at the application phase, especially for solar energy. I can couple solar energy with desalination, but to couple geothermal energy, wind energy, wave energy, you know, many people in the offshore, they are thinking, okay, I will couple wave energy with desalination. It's still low TRL. So we are still relying on solar panel, but to provide eight kilowatt hour per cubic meter, I need, you know, half of this room of solar panels. So still, is not something that is easy to implement. And well, oversimplifying is not the way. Few case studies, give me two minutes, because these are very relevant. Well, this is the desalination plant in Formia. The challenge is uh, to safeguard the sea, and Posidonia is here. So this is a mobile plant where this is real cost, three euro per cubic meter, per 1,500 cubic meter total production. Is a mobile because uh, this, this uh, city is uh, needing uh, desalinated water during the summer. During winter is fine, there are no tourists. We have the uh, uptake uh, and discharge of brine here. And well, in terms of engineering, everything is quite consolidated. What is obligatory is to study the impact of brine 
and where the main ecosystem uh, sensibility is. Here we have the Posidonia, and in this case, uh, we can see how the impact is in uh, five to 10 meters from the point of discharge, while uh, at design phase, uh, here no main major uh, challenges were found. This is during the design. It's very important to do this, these uh, studies uh, carefully. What about uh, during the monitoring? This is Ventotene Island. Probably you know Ventotene is very well known from a touristic point of view. And here, the salination is already in place and this is the point of discharge. And uh, the venting species and the ecosystem is under monitoring during the operation of desalination. So design, I need to monitor. Operation, I need to monitor again. And uh, what I need to do when I need to plan. This is Elba Island, is under uh, construction now. You know, to produce uh, about uh, 80 liters per second, I need 15 million euros. Let's talk about numbers. 15 million, only capex, plus three euro per cubic meter. is still expensive, okay? And energy consumption 2.5 is very, very uh, new plant. In this case, uh, there was a lot of discussion, more than 10 years of discussion. And after all this discussion, very good uh, result. Why? Because there are not only attention on uh, the environment or landscape, as you can see here, but also specific projects were carried out to safeguard Posidonia. And also, in particular, reforestation of Posidonia and transplanting of Pinanobles was in place in the area. So the attention was for the tourist, for the city, for the landscape, and for the sea. I think this is a, a good case study to show. Last but not least, what we do with brine. From a research point of view, we need to think about brine as a source of value. And uh, this is uh, an Horizon 2020 Innovation Action implemented in Pantelleria, where from brine we can recover salts, uh, we can recover even fertilizers, uh, the challenge is uh, to scale up. Uh, we have pilots, but still the TRL is low. And what are we doing in, uh, in islands, in small islands? We are also working on uh, uh, nature-based solution. And this is an example of a demo plant that is in Tinos, uh, where seawater brine is uh, desalinated via nature-based solution. But again, this is good for very low quantity, cannot be sustainable for larger production. So, thank you very much for your attention. This was my last slide, and I'm here very glad to reply to your questions. Thank you, Professor Fatone. <clears throat> very interesting presentation. I hope that our audience will have many questions in the discussion part, of course, and for the continuation of our session, we are inviting the speaker who will join us in virtual. I hope the Matteo is here. Yes? Yes. Happy to see you. I'm always worried about these uh, <clears throat> technical issues. Uh, Dr. Matteo Senzi is a researcher in an organic chemistry at the University of Modena and uh, Reggio Emilia in Italy. He is going to present his work on the development of biosensors based on organic electronics for food freshness in the framework of the Project ICHTIS. Project ICHTIS aims to optimize, optimize novel value chains for fish and seafood products to reach the EU market and to develop an, an integrated, sustainable approach to improve quality and reduce product loss during the supply chain. So, Matteo, floor is yours for the next 10 to 12 minutes, and uh, you can share your presentation or we can support here uh, from, from the room. Okay. You can yeah, you can see the presentation. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone and thank you for the possibility to talk today. So I'm a researcher at the University of Modena Reggio Emilia in Italy and uh, I work in the group of organic electronics directed by Professor Fabio Biscarini, where we work mainly on the development of uh, chemosensors and biosensors. So today I'm going to talk briefly about a project that we have in collaboration with uh, companies and uh, academic institutions of Europe, which is uh, the project ICTIS, which is a staff exchange project. So the idea is to share the knowledge between the countries and the companies, in particular to uh, develop an uh, integrated sustainable approach to improve the quality and in particular reduce the product loss in the fish and seafood products. 
So the project coordinator is the CCMAR in uh, Portugal. Then we have collaboration with uh, Spain, Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, and uh, um, the Netherlands also. So the, the idea of the project is to merge different uh, expertise from the different uh, partners. So to face different topics. So in particular, to try to extend the shelf life of fish and shellfish product to develop innovative and safe seafood product for high and desired sensor characteristics, establish the basis of the non-thermal processing, and also to improve the safety of food consumption, so related to, for example, to allergens. From uh, in Modena, we are working mainly on the topic of develop active and intelligent packaging for seafood products, and in particular, biosensors to be integrated in the packaging. So the, what is the general idea is to have a platform device able to monitor the fish freshness, freshness along the cold chain. And uh, this can, of course, be useful to reduce the food waste, which is always a large issue in, uh, in the production of, uh, of fish in particular. And uh, so we did uh, a platform that can be integrated in the packaging or used uh, along the production chain to monitor the, the fish. Uh, so to able to uh, detect uh, the presence, for example, of uh, chemicals that are released upon food degradation, that uh, temperature variation, so above a threshold for a long time, uh, has been, uh, the product has been exposed to high temperature, and so induce the degradation of the food, or uh, if there have been packaging leaks. This, of course, uh, can... Uh, allow to have uh, to reduce again the food waste but also to improve the safety of the consumer the final consumer in our lab we work uh, with uh, biosensors based on transistors and again based on organic and graphene based electronic devices so we uh, most of our work uh, since now has been developed in the field of healthcare applications, but uh, the technology can be moved uh, to different uh, sectors. Now we are doing this uh, project about uh, the food freshness with thanks to the collaboration with uh, the other uh, partners of the project. What are the advantages of this technology? This technology allows have some properties that made, make it uh, good for this field, for example, these devices are portable. Here we see some example. They can be made on flexible substrates. They are cost effective, so they can be produced in large amount with uh, low cost, uh, like uh, with printing technologies, for example. They are easy to use and they require a low amount of sample. Like for the medical application, this is very important. For example, we can use uh, samples of few microliters. And also they require low voltages and uh, so they don't, also they don't need uh, a lot of energy to work. What is the concept of, uh, in general, of, of a biosensor? We have a biorecognition element, which is commonly, for example, again, in uh, most of the biosensors is, for example, an antibody, which is able to detect uh, an analyte, which is an antigen, it can be a molecule, DNA, uh, a volatile organic compound, for example. And this process of biorecognition is transduced in a signal that can be easily read. In our case, uh, with the transistor-based biosensor, the device is made in a way that is a three-electrode device, like all the transistors. Two of these electrodes are connected to an active material, which is, for example, organic semiconductors or graphene, in contact with an electrolyte that can be uh, water or can be an hydrogel, for example, which is in contact with a third electrode called the gate electrode, which is functionalized with the biorecognition element. So the binding of the analyte to the biorecognition element is amplified thanks to the interplay between the interfaces in the solution by the channel. So we don't need labels, so it's a label-free technology, so we don't need fluorophores or chromophores, for example, and uh, is based essentially in the measurement of an output current. We measure a current between these two electrodes, that passes through the organic material. So we just need uh, to have uh, the device exposed to a liquid sample or to a, to a gas, and then we can have uh, the response of the device. What is the advantage also of this technology is that uh, it can, uh, thanks to this uh, amplification, can uh, 
detect a really low concentration of analyte, like in the medical uh, devices can attain like concentration of uh, uh, atomolar concentration of analyte, so really, really low concentrations. And so it can uh, uh, allow an early detection of uh, when uh, the development is still, uh, for example, of a uh, degradation uh, mole molecule generated by degradation is early. Of course, what is needed for a biosensor, which is uh, what is uh, we are working on also, should be, of course, reliable and cost effective, because if it should be integrating in the packaging, it should be, of course, cost effective. So we, we started to develop uh, some uh, freshness uh, sensor target. Uh, with, uh, we work with the classic freshness uh, sensors target, like biogenica mines and volatile organic compounds. So all kind of targets that are um, developed from produced by food when it is degraded and in particular biogenic amines from fish. So I will show quickly some examples of this uh, technology or what uh, we, uh, we have done for the moment. Of course, I have to uh, anticipate these are all uh, uh, projects in TR TRL3 uh, or 4, so not uh, ready technology, but we are still working, we are working on implementation. So the first one is uh, classic pH sensor, so which is based on reduced graphene oxide with a device, we can see here an example of the device made by Microsoft Technologies, which in this a glass device of one centimeter, which is thin, uh, less than one millimeter thin. And here we see this curve that you see here is a classic response of this device when it's measured. So this is the current that we measure as output of the uh, biosensor. Here we can see that we just by exposing the device to different uh, conditions of pH, we can see a different response of the current. Then another advantage of these devices, they are multi-parametric. So we can, from the current, we can extract other parameters that we can follow to uh, observe the variation, for example, of pH. So variation of pH is interesting, for example, for the acidification due to the CO2 in solution or alkalinization due to the amines that are released in the solution of the uh, of the fish, for example. Uh, here we can see that we have a response depending on the pH and uh, the advantage is that, uh, and this is very important in particular for the biosensor that I will show later is that we can also not only achieve a detection of the analyte, but we can think also about a quantification. So we can have an idea of the range of the analyte that we are working, that we are in presence. Another uh, kind of device that is uh, important in uh, food is uh, the temperature leakage sensor. So a device able to detect a leakage in the packaging or a change of temperature for a long time. Here we started working with uh, some hydrogels. Here you can see an example made of uh, reduced graphene oxide and P.PSS. So what is the advantage is <coughs> is an hydrogel, so it's full of water, and this water is released with a specific thermodynamics depending on the temperature, which is uh, the, the hydrogel itself, and the presence or not of different concentration of in the atmosphere, like of oxygen and other components. So in this way, like, for example, just measuring the change of weight of this uh, hydrogel, we can see that we can distinguish between uh, different conditions. So if this, the hydrogel has been exposed to 4 degrees or 20 degrees or 20 degrees, but with a leak uh, in the packaging. So this uh, kind of technology, then the advantage is that uh, we can use the hydrogel itself as a gate because it's conductive, so the gate of the transistor. And then we can use this uh, to uh, monitor again the different condition that we observe in the sample. So this is a very also this is also very yeah. Uh, we we have pretty limited time for for the presentation yeah. and One audience minute. is not okay. so for the uh, technical uh, let me say, okay, okay. background. Okay. So yeah, I will be quick. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just so quickly, so we also developed a sensor for acetaldehyde, which is another uh, typical. Uh, uh, VOC produced uh, and uh, one for multiple amines. So here the important point is that we can distinguish between different amines. So the condition if we have just one or more than one. So this is uh, important, for example, for fish degradation. And we are making them uh, on flexible substrates of polyamide that are cheaper and uh, can be integrated in uh, polymeric uh, wrapping. Okay, so 
just to resume that uh, wanted to show that we are developing this technology based on uh, organic materials and graphene to realize sensor that can be integrated in the packaging and now the next step is to make them thin and flexible and uh, more cost effective so thank you to all the partners and the group uh, and uh, for you you for your attention Thank you, Matteo. Excuse me for speeding up because we have uh, remaining two, two more speakers and we yeah. have limited time for the session. Very interesting experience you shared with, with us uh, and, uh, and the project. And we hope uh, the, for the next, uh, let me say, years we will see the result, concrete result applying on the, on the spot. So please uh, stay with us in case there is a question from the audience. And uh, we are now uh, moving to the next panelist. Uh, from our first panelist, uh, Professor Fatone, who introduced us with the water scarcity in the Mediterranean region due to climate change and the development of the tourism industry. Now we will continue with uh, some innovative actions how to resolve another problem this region faces from the same reasons which is energy shortage. Now, our next panelist is Mr. Christo Valantis Ketikidis. I hope that I pronounce in the correct way. From 2006, Mr. Ketikidis is a research associate in the Center of the Research and Technology of Hellas uh, in the Greece. He has more than 20 years of professional experience, including lead or coordination function in the project-based environment, as well as managing of several European projects in the domain in green and partly blue growth. Mr. Ketikidis will share us experience how to resolve energy shortage using seawater as an unlimited source of energy. Potential of uh, installation of the seawater heat pumps actually share some indicative good examples from the wide engineering research portfolio that uh, Research for Center and Technology of Hellas have. Uh, floor is yours for next. Uh, let 10 minutes. Say 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Milena, for this invitation and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, okay. Uh, I won't introduce myself once again. Valantis Ketiki, this is my short name, a research associate at SERF. So, uh, what I will present you today is uh, two things. Uh, we will cover partly uh, the blue energy, and uh, as Milena said, uh, we will have a look on the renewable energy. Um, uh, renewable uh, heating and cooling of buildings with the use of seawater through heat pumps installation. And then we will have also a look on the maritime, coastal and cruise tourism and see how we certify the power of uh, fishing vessels and why this is very important to certify, to verify and to monitor this power of the fishing vessels. Okay, um, the rationale. First of all, uh, um, renewable heating and cooling through uh, the installation of uh, heat pumps, which use seawater. Why seawater? You, you know, you have a lot of uh, uh, medium and high uh, um, demand uh, uh, buildings like hotels at the coastline, which are using, uh, um, which have a need for heating and cooling in the big domain. So you need a lot of water if you are talking uh, about geothermal energy and uh, the installation of heat pumps. So in connection with Professor Fatone's uh, um, presentation about the water scarcity, if you are next to the coastline, you can easily have a lot of water at the sea. So uh, in principle, you intake the water from the sea, you use it through the heat pump for cooling and uh, uh, um, heating purposes. So uh, um, everything uh, is uh, uh, I'm coming back to the EU Green Deal, as uh, uh, Mrs. Hadziani said. Okay, we want to uh, um, decarbonize uh, um, uh, Europe by uh, 2030. So heat pumps are a good means in order to promote uh, um, this renewable heating and cooling. Um, uh, you see here uh, within the project, uh, the CDM project, we had the uh, installation of uh, three. Uh, pilot uh, uh, projects. Uh, one here in uh, um, Alexa. Oh, sorry, no. One in Alexandropoli, one uh, in Kretvenica in Croatia, and one in Dubrovnik in a historical building. 
So once again about synergies and about, about cross-cutting activities. Uh, renewable heating and cooling on the one hand, if you combine it with the desalination of Professor Fatonis, and if you have also the installation of uh, PVs, for example, then you have a very good example of sustainable tourism. As I said, there are a lot of uh, examples uh, in the hotel sector which are using uh, um, seawater for heating and cooling. Also, the Dubrovnik uh, example is a very good uh, um, case where you have an historical building and you have the installation there. So that you don't have any visual impact on this historical building. And in principle, you are addressing also the, um, heritage, the cultural and heritage buildings through the sustainable uh, um, tourism model. Um, further on, okay, you see here uh, the pilot application, the installation in Greece. We did not uh, take directly water from the sea because um, uh, there was a little bit uh, um, complicated uh, the licensing procedure. So the most uh, convenient, easy way is just to drill, like you see here, uh, um, drillings uh, for intake and outtake of the water and the whole uh, um, uh, application um, on the right. So in principle, uh, you make your drillings, you have your water filtered, so you don't have any expensive filtering processes uh, um, uh, applied. And uh, you just uh, need m a higher capex in this case because uh, uh, you are talking about seawater, so you have a corrosive environment, which means some uh, uh, um, pumps, submersive pumps should be uh, um, durable and uh, resistant, corrosive resistant, and also some heat exchanges should be from uh, special materials like titanium, for example, which is increasing the capex. So, once again, uh, uh, regarding the project here, um, how to relate it to the USS strategy and how to relate it to the blue graph and to the strategy of this pillar. So, the main outputs of this project were uh, um, a transnational seawater um, heat pump network to support the sustainable development of this domain in the Arion, of course. Um, also to have a, a kind of um, a partnership and alliances between businesses and academia, and to boost the innovation and the capacity of the heat pump sector through innovation skills to capacities, competencies, and to elaborate, of course, a common strategy, how to promote this technology. Okay. No special reference to the US Air, which was launched by a commission in 2014. I mean, we are here and we are, uh, for two or three days, we are hearing about the strategy. Just a, a, um, a, um, a combination with the Blue Growth and with the project's Blue Growth strategy. So the project, yes, it, has, uh, it had a proof of concept, which was the installation of this pilot application, just to showcase uh, also from a scientific and operational point of view, yes, it is feasible to have an installation, an installation in our case in a public building, and it is easily scalable because a lot of ho hotels are using this technology, not only in Greece, all over the Mediterranean. Yes, it is also feasible to combine it with the desalination, to have a hybrid systems producing uh, or as, uh, producing res in order to have a function uh, um, environmental friendly. And um, uh, um, as I said, it was a proof of concept which was uh, used for the strategy design. One moment. No, I'm going, no, no. Okay, um, here you see some technical information about the flow chart, the water intake, uh, the room it was fi uh, um, heated and cooled, it was a sports fa this facility belonging to the municipality. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 sorry. Okay. Okay. Of course, we had also some difficulties. I mean, you don't have only good practice examples. You, has, you, you learn also from some bad practice examples. For example, if you are talking about a proof of concept and a procurement, it could be uh, there are possibilities that the procurements are uh, um, uh, long-lasting, for example. In our case, 
the, the installation was uh, built in uh, a municipality which was not belonging to our uh, research facility. So uh, it was, uh, we had a lot of bureaucratic, uh, uh, a lot of bureaucracy involved in this proof of concept. In any case, um, these uh, difficulties uh, which we were encountering um, during this implementation of the project, they led to uh, um, recommendations. So these recommendations have been proposed for further, to further progress and understand the use strategy of this Adrian uh, area, and also to pr prepare and to produce some awareness and capacity building activities, knowledge sharing platforms, for example, as you see here. Here we have a lot of companies uh, um, involved in this domain and which we are facilitating the process. Building bridges and collaborations, of course, as I said, between research and academia, something which is very important um, to proceed with your uh, project. So um, the project's Blue Growth Strategy, um, it was elaborating the potential of the seawater. As uh, I said, we need uh, um, buildings next to the coastline, either public or private. And it was identifying um, areas like access to finance, how we fund uh, our renewable energy in this domain, what is required from a technological point of view, what kind of uh, technological infrastructure is uh, required, labor market and employment, skills, reskilling, upskilling, if we are talking in this uh, field, yes, also very important because you need uh, experienced installers and you need also certified installers, partly if this is possible. Awareness and knowledge, of course. Uh, this is a, a field uh, which was in Greece not very well long, known. So we had uh, a lot of dissemination activities. Uh, um, uh, a lot of public authorities uh, were really listening and very interested in, uh, uh, in applying this kind of heating and cooling, especially now uh, where we have this energy crisis and uh, expensive energy. And uh, uh, um, the relevance of the blue growth, okay. Heat pumps are not belonging to the blue growth. They are mostly um, a green growth. In any case, we are talking about a cross-cutting uh, um, domain here. As Mrs. Khadzijani said, we have also the floating PVs. We have also the, 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 the floating wind uh, parks. So uh, yes, it's a multidisciplinary or cross-cutting approach in this sense. So we had, although we were mostly uh, green growth. We had also a blue growth strategy, which is uh, um, embedded in the pillar one of the blue growth. So this is um, all uh, regarding uh, the project and how to promote the seawater heat pumps in the Adriatic. And the next uh, um, uh, case is a more technical case. Um, uh, it started with uh, um, uh, the moderators here who were uh, addressing to self uh, um, the Ministry of Rural Development and Food and they addressed to self uh, in order to have an elaboration of an road map in order to certify the power of the uh, fishing vessels engines. And why is this so important? Um, there is a regulation uh, from the commission and uh, um, it says uh, um, if you want to um, have a license for the fishing, Amount. We have to know what kind of uh, how much power your 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 vessel has. So um, um, the engine power of the fishing vessels is one of the measures used to control fishing effort and to determine the fleet size. So you need someone who is uh, certifying uh, um, this uh, um, this framework. You need someone who is verifying that you are uh, measuring the right way, and you have to monitor also the power of these fishing vessels in order to have um, an overview of what is being fished and how much. Um, all MS uh, countries have to ensure that the total capacity corresponding to the fishing licenses issued shall, be, uh, shall not be higher than the maximum capacity levels established in each uh, member state. And this is also uh, essential that we um, register the power and this registered power is reliable. So this is what uh, uh, SELF uh, did. It elaborated uh, a roadmap how to uh, um, uh, establish this framework, certification, verification, monitoring of the power of the fishing vessels engines through an action plan, a twofold action plan with technical guidelines. 
and uh, with a mapping of course of the whole landscape uh, with competent authorities and involved stakeholders. I will uh, um, finish in one minute. And this is the last slide and uh, this concludes the roadmap. Okay, the relevance to the Blue Glove. Uh, uh, um, uh, we used uh, such expertise in order to address the Blue Glove through this roadmap. This is the last uh, presentation. I thank you for the inv invitation and uh, uh, um, for your attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, <clears throat> for your interesting presentation. It is not always easy to, uh, let's say, conduct some research and development activities, and after that to put that, uh, to disseminate, to put that in the in the practice. So thank you for that. I'm very well familiar me uh, for this uh, last part of your presentation about engine power because majority of the TRG uh, members coming from the fishery sector. Mm -hmm. So we are very, very well known about that activities and actually how it is uh, very hard to perform that, uh, that activity in, in the countries. So thank you very much also for sharing that. And uh, now we are uh, proceeding to, the, to, to our next or, or uh, uh, last speaker. It is uh, Peter Medica who is going to share with us some experience of the Blue Air Project. Uh, from the perspective of being uh, 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 pillar one, I would say a few words. Why is blue air important for the EU, sir? Uh, be, uh, because we have fragmented situation in the all uh, Adriatic and Union blue growth innovation policies. Some, com some countries are pioneers and some still uh, lagging behind. There is a need for harmonizing the blue growth policies in the macro regional level. Although the situation of, uh, is fragmented, Blue air is important from, from the uh, blue growth because of the definition of the common S3 policy on the blue growth at macro regional of Adriatic and Union, but on the, on, the, uh, on the other hand, still guaranteeing the alignment of the local initiatives with the EU cell. Implementation of this project brings some important deliverables, such as development of the innovation strategy for the blue growth, as well as establishment of the Blue Air Innovation Community, Mr. Medica will inform us today, and also a few words about you or you want to do by yourself. But just to say that uh, Mr. Medica is Senior Project Manager at Technology Park of Ljubljana with uh, over 20 years of experience in research, in government sector, and in business sector. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours for next the 10 minutes. <laughs> so, okay. thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, in order to stay in the time limits, I will ask you to allow me to to be seated, to remain seated, because I have some notes on my on my uh, iPad here, and I would really like to stick to those notes. Otherwise, I will just talk, start to talk too much, and <laughs> we will use more than twenty minutes. So, uh, first of all, thank the. I would like to thank the coordinators of the EUSAR Pillar One for inviting us the forum and offering us uh, this opportunity to present the uh, uh, Blue Air uh, Innovation Community in the thematic uh, pillar session. So uh, indeed, um, the uh, Blue Air Innovation Community is an output of the strategic uh, Blue Air project, uh, which is uh, co-financed by the inter Adrian program. Uh, and consists of 11, uh, 11 partners from, from eight countries. And the Blue Air project is aiming at uh, improving the competencies of all innovation actors, identifying the, the sectors of macro regional interest and exploiting potentials for transregional cooperation uh, and supporting the development uh, of a macro regional innovation community in the blue economy. So in the project, we, we investigated uh, innovation policies uh, dealing with the blue economy in other sea basins. We developed and tested the S3 decision-making toolkit for, for, for our policy makers, for our decision makers. Among others, we did many, many different uh, capacity building uh, activities uh, for our stakeholders. And uh, on, through many events, we, we tried to capitalize uh, our findings. So the Blue Air Innovation Community is basically a result of this uh, two and a half year uh, long process uh, aimed at improving the knowledge, uh, skills, uh, competencies of different stakeholders 
with the ultimate goal of uh, creating and enhancing uh, a macro-regional uh, innovation ecosystem in the field of uh, the blue economy. So let's, let's uh, first have a look at the status of the blue innovation in the Adriatic and the Ionian uh, region. So uh, regarding the innovation performance, uh, the Adriatic and the Ionian regions uh, lag behind uh, more developed uh, regions in Europe. I mean, in, in terms of innovation in general, not, not only related to the, to the blue innovation. Most regions are at best moderate or even emerging uh, innovators. Only a few of them are strong innovators. Also, uh, that data from a uh, Blue Economy report shows that the Adriatic and the Ionian region is lagging uh, behind uh, other uh, sea basins in terms of gross, uh, gross uh, value added per person employed in the Blue Economy sectors. For example, the GVA per person employed in the Adriatic and Ionian region is just about 50% uh, of the one in the Baltic Sea region. The Adriatic and the Ionian Basin is also the basin with the second lowest proportions of regions and countries with blue growth in their S3 priorities. Except for some, uh, the Adriatic and the Ionian regions do not tend to participate in S3 thematic partnerships. In, I mean, not only related to the blue economy, but, but also in other three partners, uh, partnerships. So there are just a few maritime clusters. All are, you know, established at the national or even regional uh, levels. So that we don't have a macro-regional uh, maritime cluster. The level of transregional collaboration is quite low in many parts of the blue e blue economy. Perhaps only with the only distinctions through uh, different EU-funded projects. And. Uh, also, the industry lacks uh, the investments in, in innovation. The results of mapping and uh, technology potentials among innovator ac innovation actors in the Adriatic and the Ionian regions uh, show that only about one third of businesses that uh, one third of, of businesses uh, businesses haven't introduced any new innovation in the last three years. And these are among the uh, blue economy businesses. But uh, we are also glad that uh, in the EDP process that we did in our, in our project, uh, so the entrepreneurial uh, discovery process, a lot of knowledge and expertise in blue technology development we, uh, exist in, in, in our macro region, and which is even more interesting or important, it exists also in the inland regions, so landlocked countries, Serbia for example, not only on the coastal areas, and this region also, I mean, the macro region has also a lot of knowledge, expertise, infrastructure in all blue economy topics and sectors. But it's unfortunately very fragmented and only limited, limitedly uh, accessible, accessible, let's say, in terms of open innovation uh, approach. So collaboration across borders and dif between different regions uh, must be crucial for, for small national communities, uh, such as we have many in, in, in the Adriatic and the Ionian region. For example, starting from my own country, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Albania. May each one, uh, each separately have a very limited uh, critical mass, let's say in terms of specific knowledge or expertise or infrastructure. and you know, uh, opening themselves towards the uh, macro-regional collaboration. I mean, we can pull from much bigger source of knowledge, infrastructure, expertise, and so on. So, as said already, uh, I mean, this, this pool, pool is much, 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 much bigger. Uh, and also through the stakeholder engage, uh, stakeholders engagement process uh, in, in, in our project, we collected the views and uh, thoughts of uh, different stakeholders from the whole macro region. Uh, altogether, there were more than 200 uh, of them uh, on different occasions. So on the biggest challenges and uh, opportunities for the, uh, for the advancement of uh, the blue economy in, and the blue innovation. And there were many, uh, of course, many challenges and opportunities uh, identified. But a lot of them were, were related, were dealing with the need for a more uh, coordinated cooperation uh, for the benefit and the development of the blue economy. So therefore, one of our policy recommendations was also to set up a macro-regional innovation community 
for strengthening uh, cooperation among all, all innovation actors. And again, the results of the entrepreneurial discovery process uh, show that the current level of collaboration uh, in the industry and research uh, sectors uh, needs to be further enhanced by building strong partnerships and networks uh, to foster innovation uh, and promote uh, socioeconomic growth. So we also could, uh, could learn uh, many valuable lessons uh, on our learning trips in, to innovation networks in, in Barcelona and Berlin, for example. The Submariner Network uh, is, an, is a, partic a particular prime example of a well-performing uh, innovation network in the field of the blue economy. Uh, backed by uh, the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region with more than 20 projects currently uh, going on at this moment with I don't know, perhaps 50 projects already finished and so on. And this has contributed uh, a great deal to the, to the development uh, in the blue economy in that region. Ah, sorry. So Okay, so what is then the, the Blue Air Innovation Community? So we like to say it's an open platform that uh, aims to enhance and streamline uh, innovation collaboration at both uh, regional and macro-regional levels to drive sustainable blue economy in the Adriatic and Ionian region. And when I say an open platform, uh, I mean that the scoping and shaping of the Blue Air uh, Innovation uh, Community has been a, an open process in the, since the very beginning uh, a few months ago. And more than 100 uh, stakeholders uh, from industry, research, public administrations, NGO, NGOs, uh, have been involved uh, in the definition of the innovation community's objectives and principles, and they provided many valuable ideas and suggestions. Uh, it is also open in the sense of the membership of uh, stakeholders. So the community welcomes uh, both organizations and individuals. Either these individual, individuals work for this uh, or affiliated with these organizations or they are freelancers or not affiliated at all, just you know, uh, private, uh, private persons. So by an open platform, we also mean that uh, it's upon the members of the community to decide and create collaborative uh, innovation actions according to their specific uh, uh, needs, uh, their professional or private interests, uh, the needs for specific knowledge, expertise, infrastructure, uh, expected impact, so that they collaborate and work together in a way that would suit best uh, their interests and needs. This is, this is right now. So together with, as I said, uh, more than 100 stakeholders in innovation actors, we have defined, uh, we have developed the Innovation Community Manifesto, uh, which defines several objectives or tasks of uh, the community shall, uh, shall pursue. I won't read them all because uh, you can see them here and uh, also the, the, the uh, the Blue Air Innovation Community Manifesto is uh, publicly, uh, pub I mean, it's published on the website and also on the registration uh, page. Uh, so uh, you can, you can uh, see it there in order to uh, not waste too much time. And uh, yeah, so the next uh, slide, so perhaps just how we, we feel uh, that this community should operate. So it should operate on different levels. At the micro, micro level, uh, let's say, uh, individual, uh, individual stakeholders collaborate uh, together within thematic or working groups uh, to develop innovative solutions, uh, projects related to the blue economy uh, sectors or value chains. At the meso level, uh, these uh, thematic or working groups uh, collaborate uh, between themselves and with other stakeholders to scale up those innovative solutions and projects, to promote collaboration, networking, and share the best practices. And at the macro, macro level, uh, the Blue Air Innovation Community uh, work uh, with regional and national governments, uh, macro-regional actors, the European Union, international initiatives, international networks, so to influence policies, develop fun funding opportunities, promote the macro-regional innovation ecosystem in the blue economy. Uh, 
Oh, so, um, one one slide in front. So uh, in the beginning, the, the Blue Air Innovation Community will, will use some of the existing communication channels uh, to make the exchange of information and matchmaking between its members uh, possible. Uh, we have already opened a LinkedIn group uh, in which we invite all stakeholders with uh, LinkedIn profiles to sign. Uh, we also opened a dedicated room on the Marina platform, uh, the platform perhaps many of you already know. Uh, it provides a virtual space for several blue, blue economy communities from the Mediterranean area. And besides information exchange and uh, matchmaking and the creation of different actions using the Marina platform will also allow us to, to, to uh, cooperate and cross fertilize uh, with other existing blue, blue communities uh, and initiatives and offering uh, additional opportunities for cooperation in and beyond uh, our community. And also all uh, members of the community will also, of course, receive some regular newsletters with news, uh, partner search, uh, event announcements and all other information uh, the members uh, will, will share, we will want to share with, with, with their peers and other, other uh, members of the community. So uh, to conclude, <laughs> It's already here. <laughs> uh, the Blue Air Innovation Community offers a unique uh, platform for collaboration, uh, for collaboration, knowledge sharing, collective action in the Adriatic and the Ionian uh, region. So by getting involved, uh, you will become a part uh, of a diverse network of stakeholders, uh, including uh, industry leaders, researchers, policy makers, NGOs. And together we aim to promote uh, collective action, uh, collective innovation, build, build strong partnership, advocate for policies to support the growth of the blue economy in a sustainable way. And I'm inviting you to join the community and become part of the transformative journey towards, uh, let's say, a more sustainable and innovative blue economy in the Adriatic and the Ionian region. I invite you to work together, that we work together towards the adoption uh, and development of new technologies, uh, business models towards stronger uh, uh, collaboration between industry, research, uh, government, uh, public, uh, in general public, towards the exchange of, of best practices uh, and knowledge sharing at the transnational level. And I think only by working together, we can ensure that the blue economy in the Adriatic and the Ionian region continues to grow and thrive in a, in a sustainable and innovative way. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. So my Thank you, Peter. Thank you, all panelists and host keynote. And now we have uh, <clears throat> some uh, time for the discussion part. So maybe we have 10 minutes to discuss about, uh, about the interesting topics that you have possibility to to um, who are presented by our panelists. So uh, now we are opening discussion part. And uh, first of all, I will ask maybe the panelists, because uh, you are experts from the field, uh, you're impressed by the presentation of other speakers. So maybe for the beginning, you have uh, questions for each other? No? OK. Uh, for the audience, Federico will have questions. Yes. For, uh, I don't know. Federico Rosset from Veneto region. Uh, first of all, thank you speakers for this uh, very interesting session. I have a question about um, desalination. So um, we have learned that uh, desalination is uh, um, still an expensive, expensive process, that um, uh, it should be an element of a, an important element, but one element of a wider uh, and integrated strategy and we, ha we have learned that uh, uh, we should develop a model uh, tailored on our, our um, Adriatic and Ionian region. So bearing this in mind, uh, I would like to ask what is uh, or what should be, in your, in your opinion, from your sp perspective, or uh, according to the study cases that, uh, that you, you showed, what should be the most, what, yes, the most suitable business model to support uh, uh, desalination. Are we talking about public investment? Are we talking about private investment? Are we talking about a mixed solution? 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico. This is the same question that I got from the Italian journalist on Sole 24 Ore. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, if we have to provide uh, water for the domestic uses, uh, it should be covered by the public tariff uh, because it's a matter of... Uh, but of course, this will then increase the public tariff. So, and in this case, it will depend a lot on the national regulatory framework that is different country by country. So harmonization is very complex because in some country, we have a fully public uh, water, urban, well, domestic water management. In other is public private, in other is uh, uh, in house and so on. Uh, when we talk about uh, a desalination that can provide water to industry and domestic, depending on the need uh, and on the season, well, in this case, of course, public private partnership uh, might be a good option. Why? Because CAPEX is still relevant. Sometimes you will need mobile plants. And mobile plants is better to, to rent, not to buy and to store. So this public-private uh, on long-term uh, uh, but adjustable conditions, uh, because this year we have uh, water scarcity, next year maybe less. Uh, well, it's, especially in this period, we are understanding how to plan water use and resources. So public-private, uh, but with the condition of revising uh, uh, well, the agreement uh, each couple of years, uh, at least at the beginning. And I think that we need a special commissioner. So in Italy, we started with the National Commission on Water Scarcity. I think it's a very good idea. But the, this National Commissioner, it actually is from the Veneto, Veneto region, he will have the duty of supervising and monitoring this uh, holistic planning. Because we have to avoid that, OK, we will be the desalination, so we will have more water, and we don't care about water efficiency. So yes, so you will have desalination, but given that your first priority is the efficiency so i think public private is one of the best option if you need water for your industry you will build your own desalination plant but again with all these conditions to safeguard the uh, sea ecosystem that is a lot of money Well, um, regarding the last thing, uh, the drawback, of course, you are talking about uh, uh, building stock next to the sea. So this is a prerequisite, uh, net, not uh, one or two meters uh, next to the sea. Okay, you can go uh, a little bit further, let's say like one kilometer from the shore, in order to take advantage from the seawater, even if it is a sea, wa sea water or brine water, or um, it could be also fresh water. Uh, what, you are uh, what you are needing is uh, enough quantity and if you are talking about the efficiency then you need also water in uh, with a specific temperature so yes uh, um, um, you can go uh, uh, 20 or 50 meter deep either in the sea bed or uh, uh, on the ground if you are talking about drilling like we do in Greece um, the drawbacks yes you need uh, uh, space for the drillings uh, if we are talking about drilling so you need uh, space for the equipment and access to your ground um, uh, we're talking about public works partly not only uh, procurement of, uh, of uh, and product so um, yes, you, you will have a, a construction phase, which is also weather dependent. I mean, uh, if you are talking about drillings, you can't drill uh, during the winter season in Greece, for example. Um, this has also to be taken into account. Uh, after the construction, um, you don't have any visual impact on the building. So everything is covered and there's also no noise. So this is very important. Um, if you are talking about uh, other concepts like direct intake of water, yes, for the construction, you need also a lot of permits. 
uh, urban department, for example, and also the, 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 the port authority should issue some uh, licenses uh, for the water intake and the water recharge. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question sufficiently. <laughs> I thank you. And then I would like to ask Mr. Medican about uh, when are you going to officially launch your innovation community? Yeah, the, the Blue Air <coughs> Innovation uh, Community will be officially launched in uh, at our project's final event in Trieste on the 11th of, of uh, July this year. But however, uh, as I already said today, the doors to the community are already open. So uh, I showed you the, the, the QR code and the, the link, uh, how, uh, I mean, to the registration form to the community. Uh, and also in the following weeks, uh, we will send uh, so some kind of uh, emails to, to all stakeholders who are uh, working in the project and collaborated with us uh, in the project to join the community. So, yeah, officially it will be opened on the 11th of July, but uh, basically the doors are already open. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's Milena. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, is there we, we have Milena? For question. Just Alex? for a second, if I can follow up on this question, uh, just a suggestion, just a couple of seconds. Well, following up on this question, I would like to suggest we have already discussed with the partners of the Blue Air project in other locations. I think this uh, this um, uh, innovation community may consider her participation uh, as a, an interregional partnership uh, under this uh, platform for a sustainable blue economy and implementation of smart specialization strategies. And uh, I'm saying that because you have done a lot of work. You have identified in the micro region area a couple of uh, uh, interesting uh, priorities of the interest of the, of the countries. So you can build on that work, uh, exchange with your, uh, if I may say, members of this community and consider this possibility to express your interest for an interregional partnership uh, uh, to DG region. And I will complement as well. It is uh, interesting your, your point, but also do not forget uh, regions who are lagging behind in the, all, all these aspects. So we need that know-how transfer, uh, uh, transfer from the European countries to the non-European countries in the context of, uh, of our strategy, of course. Thank you all. In case there is, uh, we have time maybe for one question. If uh, somebody wants to raise question, no. And now we are proceeding with the conclusions. Today with us is Jorgos Emanuel from the European Commission, from the EGDP, to sum up results. If you are comfortable, you can, you can speak. Okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, I would like to thank the PILA coordinators for organizing this very interesting event. I would like also to thank the uh, speakers for their contribution uh, presenting this uh, uh, new emerging policy sector of the new economy. Uh, in particular, your contributions have highlighted the Adriatic and Ionia region's needs for economic growth, research and innovation, job creation, as well as support to local communities, while ensuring the protection and conservation of the marine ecosystem and its resources. In the context of Pillar 1 session, issues concerning the development of the sustainable blue economy, green and digital transition, as well as smart specialization in circular economy in the Adriatic and Ionia region were discussed. A reference was made to the contribution of integrated water management from desalination to waste water treatment. In addition, innovative methods that contribute to monitoring the seafood products were presented. Finally, ways to strengthen cooperation and collective actions for the sustainable and innovative development of the blue economy in the Adriatic and Ionian region were explored and identified the following emerging blue economy sectors and areas for cooperation. Firstly, regarding the new blue eco economy emerging sectors. The emerging sectors, ocean and marine renewable energy, will continue to be key to the EU and EUSR countries' ambitions and goals. The most notable subsector 
uh, in the blue tech biotechnology is the algae sector and other sectors as well. Cooperation on a sea basin and macro regional approach is vital for achieving the sustainability in the blue economy sectors. Uh, maritime spatial planning and innovation community are key drivers towards sustainability. Blue economy sectors generate a significant gross added value and deployment in the EU, uh, including established and emerging ones. Uh, the EMFAF fund, the Horizon Fund, the program, sorry, the Sustainable Blue Economy Partnership, as well as the integrated mainstream regional and national sectoral programs can contribute to identifying and financing research development and innovative studies, partnerships, as well as projects such as those introduced in today's session. The efficient utilization of water, blue, energy, environment, the optimization of value chains for fish and seafood products to reach the EU market and to develop an integrated sustainable approach to improve quality, efficiency and effectiveness during the supply chain. Regarding the impact on the USR Macroregional Action Plan, according to the USR methodology to, gu to guide thematic three groups in preparing the contents of the revised action plan, uh, a new feature in the revised action plan will be a specific chapter dedicated to the horizontal cross-cutting topics. Today's contribution, your contribution, to the Pillar 1 session, and therefore a, uh, a starting point to further the discussion in the revised action plan on emerging promising sectors, as well as horizontal topics and actions fostering innovative development and sustainability in the Adriatic and Ionian region. I would like to thank all of you very much for contributing to this very interesting and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Just uh, uh, finally, thank you. Thank you all of you. Thank uh, presenters for the interesting presentation. Join innovation community. <laughs> and I think uh, we uh, deserve the lunch. Lunch break is now start at 1.30. So thank you very much once again. Thank you.